your f focus. <laughs> um, <laughs> to keep your mind on what you're doing, sometimes because there's distractions. And one of those obvious distractions, probably for all of us, and you're probably going to spin off more than once during this morning's message. And, and if you do that, I just want you to try to come back to that one thought, God's with us, okay? God's with us. And let that kind of bring you back and remind you what this season is all about, no matter what's going on around us. God is with us. He is here right now. He's with us where we're at, whatever we're doing. God is with us. And so let that just kind of help you out. I'm not sure if it's because of the fall I had a few years ago when I was up on top of the two-story house, literally up at the point. So I think you're now up at about three stories high. And I had a ladder up there. And the ladder slid down the wall. And I hit the first four floor roof and then rolled off onto the concrete driveway just inches from our car. And I got up with a slight sprained ankle and a scratch on my arm. And I'm not sure if that's why I'm a little bit afraid of heights. <laughs> or if it's just because I've gotten old. <laughs> Whoever said that, thanks for loving me. <laughs> so every year it comes to the holiday season, it comes to Christmas, it comes to the, right up to Thanksgiving, and Debbie and I start having this conversation. I'm still winning, I don't know how much longer. But here's the conversation. Okay, we're not going to put lights up high this year. Yes, we are, dear. No, we're not. You just figure out how to get the star up there. That's all we're doing. Everything else is going down low. No, dear. We have to put lights up high. It looks better that way. You've got to put lights up there. And there's this, in fact, I went out and bought another strand this year. <laughs> so she couldn't say that. I didn't have enough lights to go up high. <laughs> and, you know, I, I know it's all out of love and concern for me. And I don't think she realizes, because I think she thinks I'm just a wild guy, okay? Uh, yeah, I, think t I, don't, I don't know what gave her that impression, life too long with me or something, but I don't think she realizes how when I'm climbing up that ladder, I'm literally scared. <laughs> Almost to like, okay, hold on to this, don't let it move away. So when we had the ladder at its full extension, and I was up trying to reach to the, uh, to the eaves uh, up there, up top, right? And that's where you're like, you're almost against the wall, okay? Because you've gotten now that close. I was really scared. <laughs> and yet, I wanted those lights up there. <laughs> and we got them up. And so you can come by the house and you can look. And Because I just, there's something special about Christmas time and letting the light shine. In fact, I keep trying to think of creative ways, some kind of way that the message could be there on the house. You know, what kind of word would get through to people that Jesus really matters? You know, I appreciate the phrase, Jesus is the reason for the season. He is. But I keep trying to think, there's got to be some way, some, some way to communicate. But what, what strikes me is, is that what Jesus wants us to do to communicate is in our everyday relationships to shine a light, to let people see Jesus Christ in us. It's why I've encouraged you already when you're shopping, uh, when you're going around the neighborhood, when you're talking to, the, to people, and if somebody says, Happy Holidays, yes, it, is a it is a holy day. Merry Christmas. And, and maybe they'll stop and think, what was that weird guy just saying? Okay? And what, do you, yeah, what do you mean, yes, it is a holy day? I didn't say anything about holy day. Yes, I did. <laughs> People don't realize it, do they? So even when we are trying to make it non-spiritual, I should say, our culture, right? Even when society is trying to say, okay, well, we can't say Christmas because that's going to be too close to Jesus Christ. That's spiritual. We don't want to be spiritual. So... We'll use this phrase. Do you, do you hear the irony of this? Happy Holy Days. Because that's the meaning of holiday. Happy Holy Days. 
You know, matter, no matter what the darkness tries to do, it cannot blind the light of Jesus Christ. And that should be reason for us to stand up and cheer, get excited or something, or be careful when you're on the top of a ladder. <laughs> In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Well, God, shine your light brightly. Help us to understand and to, to comprehend and to grab a hold of what it means that you are light and life and help it to make a difference in the world in which we're living in right now. In Jesus' name, amen. In him was life. Now John, John is attempting to give us the narration of the coming of Jesus Christ without going back to a baby. And yet he's, really, he's talking in powerful kinds of ways about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus becoming human flesh. God coming and living among us. Coming alive, the word of God that God used to create Jesus present in creation. But then also, Genesis 2 says, has this amazing touch to it. Then the Lord, Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. We were alive when we were dust. <laughs> we're kind of meaningless, really. It's kind of interesting. Where did God take us from? Dirt, okay? And he uses that word, from dust. <laughs> that, that's, that's our roots, if you will. <laughs> We're from dust. Kind of insignificant, isn't it? Kind of unimportant. And he says, though, though you're from dust, what happens? Genesis, God breathes. And, 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 and hear the word that is used there, the Hebrew word. God walks. <laughs> You know, careful, careful, I know you thought, you know, I know I wasn't going to spit. <laughs> but, but, but the word ruach, it's the word for spirit. It's the word for wind. And it's the word for breath. And what God did was he took man as he had formed him with his hands from dust. And he does what? He roars. He breathes breath into him. The spirit breathes life into mankind and we become a human being because the Spirit of God has breathed life into us. He gives him breath. He gives him life. And notice this, he gives him spirit. Jesus is life and light. He came into the world as a light, it says. He who was from eternity past came into time to give men life and light to their souls. One theologian says, I trust that the divine life of Christ is a reality to you. I trust that the light of God in the person of Jesus Christ has lit your heart for eternity. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. Jesus Christ is the incarnate God in the body. He is life and light. And think, listen to some of these scriptures. Matthew 7, 14. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find, in it, find it. And similarly, this word life that's being used here is the word zoe. It's the word that stands for spiritual life, eternal life. And, and every time it's used, you're going to be hearing that word, Zoe. Matthew 19, 16, Just then a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? 
John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Zoe. Verse 36, John 3, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. It's an endly difference between light and darkness, isn't it? John 5, 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but crossed from death to life. Look, the, the key here, isn't it, to eternal life is what? You're going to keep hearing it. Belief. Not the family I was born into. Not how good I am, behave. Not how much money I have in my pocket or don't have. The key is belief. John 6, 47 and 48. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, she, he's at a graveside now, right? He's heading to the, to the tomb where Lazarus has been buried. He's speaking to these two ladies whom he's loved deeply. Mary and Martha and Lazarus or have been some of his best friends here on earth. And he loves them. And he intentionally stayed away so Lazarus would die and be in the tomb for four days. So that God's will, purpose, would come through this. And what does he say to Mar Mary and Martha? Now this is eternal life. Whoops. Excuse me, I skipped ahead. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I'm going to ask this question later. I'm going to come back to it. The question he asked her, her is, do you believe this? Do you yes. believe this? Yes. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, He's talking to his disciples. He's washed their feet. He's told them he's about to die. He's literally going to die on a cross. It's going to be horrible. It's terrific. It's bloody. It's nasty. He says, I'm going to die. And, he's, and he says, I'm going away. Which is a nice way of saying I'm going to be tortured to death. And Jesus answered to Thomas, who wants to know where are you going and how are you going to get there to find you when you go there. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. As he's praying, just hours later, in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying for unity, he says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And then John, as he concludes his gospel, he gives us the reason why he wrote it all. John 20, verse 31. But these are written... For what purpose? That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Years later, he writes the letters of John where he tries to remind us about love and this relationship with God that God wants to have with us. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, he says, The life appeared. We've seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. John's basically saying, we saw him, we touched him, and we're now telling you what we've seen and heard and what we believe so you can believe it as well. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. Or 1 John 5.11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. One of the young ladies who lost a boyfriend down in San Bernardino made a comment that was kind of disturbing. Her statement was, well, my boyfriend, he, he's dead, so he's okay now. My concern is about all the rest of the people that might have to face some form of gun violence. She works, I believe it's for the mayor's office in crisis um, intervention. <laughs> Having stood with many a coroner, when they've tried to speak to a family who's just lost a loved one. I'm not convinced that coroners know for sure what they speak of. More than one time I've heard them say to a family member who has just had somebody die, <coughs> I'm ringing a little chief, who's just had somebody die, it's okay, they're in a better place. I'm not convinced the coroner has enough knowledge to know that. They may be, but what all these verses that I've just been reading to you say is that the, way, the only way to know that is by believing in Jesus Christ. And I don't hear the coroner asking, did your relative, did your son, your daughter, your husband and wife, did they believe in Jesus Christ? I don't hear them asking that at all. They simply ask things about where they lived, what kind of medicines they took, did they have a doctor. They ask them all kinds of information like that. But they have no information, knowledge at all about their spiritual life, and yet they can say they're in a better place. I'm not convinced that the coroner knows that. John goes on to say that not only is the Word of God, and later we're going to re remember, find out that he's been referring to the Word of God is Jesus Christ. He's come and lived among us, dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He is the Son of God. Well, not only is he light in life, but he says, the light shines in the darkness. How much light do you need? If we turned off, and I love it, if we had turned off all the lights in here. Have you ever been a cave, in a cave? How many? Been in a cave where they shut the lights off? Isn't that, like, frightening? <laughs> I mean, you can put your hand right here and can't see a thing. <laughs> Try as much as you might, and you can't. And then they, like, light a match or turn on one little tiny light. You could almost turn on the, the Blu-ray light from your, from your phone, right? And that, that little tiny blue light, excuse me, <laughs> that little tiny blue light, would light up space and suddenly you could see your hand and things like that. Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. It offers illumination to everybody. Suddenly when you have light, now you can see what? Color, figures, descriptions. The light shines in the darkness and, and it comes into the darkness and, it's a, and the NIV says it overcomes it. Oh, there's some more to that word though. Think about this. Listen to these words and see if you remember the context. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's John 8, chapter 12. Did I give you the hint as to what just happened before that? If you remember in the Bible, John 8 is the story of the woman caught in adultery, who's brought before Jesus, and, and the people who have brought her there want her to be stoned because that's what the law says. And Jesus writes in the ground, and eventually all those people, oh, by the way, Jesus had this other little comment, whoever's without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. Then he continues to write. And later, once he looks up, finishes writing, everyone's gone that had a stone in their hand. And the woman's standing there in front of him. He then makes this very important statement to her. Very powerful. Can you imagine this? I mean, I'm thinking she's listening. 
I think, I think she ha Jesus has her attention. So where are the ones that have uh, condemned you? They've all gone, Master. Then I don't condemn you either. The one person who could have thrown the stone, who could have thrown the first one and everyone else would have been justified to throw theirs, says, I don't condemn you either. And then he says the next statement that I think had to really hit home. Go now and sin no more. Wow. I'm thinking that lady might take him a little seriously on that one. I was just caught in adultery. I was just about to be stoned to death. I'm not going to die today. Maybe I shouldn't continue this lifestyle. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. He finishes that, she leaves, and what's the next thing that Jesus says? To the crowds who've been watching this, who knew that the Pharisees, these guys were there to try to trap Jesus, who saw all this commotion, who felt her pain, because they knew they had blown stuff too, and they're watching all this, and what does Jesus say? John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. My light's going to shine. It's going to point out your darkness. In fact, earlier in John, here's what Jesus also says. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. This is chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. How many of you would love Jesus to turn a light on this morning that shows the sins you committed this week? Yeah, maybe you didn't do too bad of ones. So you know, maybe this is a good week. You wouldn't mind them being shown to everybody. But how about if all the sins of your whole life were shown to everybody? I'm telling you, I don't want to be in that group. <laughs> okay? Uh, I don't want to have that list up there, read in front of everybody. Have you all seen? Oh, this is Bill. Da, 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 da. You guys know enough of mine already. <laughs> but see, those of us who are in the dark and have sin that we want to hold on to, we don't want a light shined on it because we don't want people to see it. We want to keep it hidden where no one will know that we've messed up. Here's an interesting thought. When you're in the dark, notice what this, the, the verses are saying here. That God actually sends a gift. And the gift is John the Baptist. And he sends him so that he can point the way to the light, which is Jesus Christ. How many of you, if you were in the dark, would need somebody to say, there's the light over there when the light goes on? Okay, We're in that totally blackened cave. And, the, and our host has moved to a different spot. And he's done it, and we don't know he's moved. And suddenly he's standing in some other place, and the light turns on. Now, would you have to tap your neighbor and say, the light's over there? You would if your neighbor was what? Blind. If your neighbor was blind, you'd have to point them to the light. If your neighbor was doing something they shouldn't be doing, like they knew, okay, hey, there's some rocks in here, and when that light goes off, I'm going to grab the rock, even though the sign says not to. And if they did that, they wouldn't like it if, when that light came on, would they? Excuse me, sir, what are you doing over there? Uh, did you not read the sign? Oh, I'm sorry, it was dark, so you couldn't read it. You're not supposed to take that gold off the ground. It's supposed to be... <laughs> The light shines in the darkness, and only blind people need to be pointed to the light. 2 Corinthians 4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The world doesn't want us to see, doesn't want anyone to see the light of Jesus Christ. But here's the wonderful thing. The light shines, the darkness tries to push it away, but the darkness cannot overcome it. 
John, incidentally, you're gonna, as if, if we do some more of John, and even as we go through the rest of this prologue, we're going to keep seeing that John really uses double words, doesn't he? And it's kind of one of the marks of John's writing. He loves to have double meanings, and in this case, he has one. He says, because one of the meanings of this term that the darkness has not overcome it is, is that the darkness can't comprehend it. The darkness can't understand it. And it is hard for some people who don't know God to understand it. And so we need somebody like a John to come to us and help us to understand. But also, the other part of this word, the second meaning of this word is the darkness cannot conquer the light. No matter what darkness does, when the light comes on, darkness goes away. Have you noticed it? You cannot, if you have a light, keep darkness there. Darkness will always leave from the light. The dark is, not, is conquered by the light. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot put it out. Satan, who is in the dark, cannot put out the light of Jesus Christ. <laughs> And that's why I think it's kind of funny that we've started, you know, our culture and businesses have started using this phrase, Happy Holidays! <laughs> they still can't put out the light of the holiness of God. And can I say this with respect and honor to those who died? Terrorists cannot put out the light of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who get too off sometimes in political things, government cannot put out the light of Jesus Christ. And family members who may have offended us and, and disrespected us and, and we don't talk to them about Jesus anymore, they cannot put out the light of Jesus Christ. And doesn't Jesus even say, don't hide your light under something that's going to shield it, but shine it so people can, say, can see. I started to sing this little light of mine. <laughs> it's interesting as we continue with our text there's kind of like this sudden what? and all of a sudden John the writer of John says verse 6 there was a man sent from God whose name was John he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe he himself was not the light he came only as a witness to the light John is a witness John is supposed to stand up there in front of a judge and jury and other people listening and tell his reasons why he believes. Interesting. Do you know what John means? The name John? Gift of God. Gift of God. God sent his gift. See, we're going to give gifts at Christmas time, right? <laughs> And we think it's because, well, because the Magi brought their gifts, right, to the baby. No, we give gifts because God gave his gift. And it's an incredible gift. It's his son. And that's why we give in response to, and so others hopefully can know this incredible gift. God sends the gift of God, John himself, to tell people about Jesus. Just like God sent the angels to the shepherds so they'd go to Bethlehem and see where this baby would lie. So he sends John to the nation of Israel so that they will get ready to see this baby who's become the living son of God. Luke 1, 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. Who's he talking to? Zechariah, who's in the temple. And the angels met with him there. Like, oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, no. Don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him gift of God. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit when? Even before he is born. Just remember that little phrase, okay? Filled with the Spirit, even before he is born, he will bring back many of the people to, of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is the promised prophet, folks, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John is a gift from God, but John is a gift who actually speaks to people while he, before he's even born. Do you remember that one? anointed by the Holy Spirit in the womb of his mother Elizabeth, verses 41 and 45 of Luke 1, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. <coughs> I 
I still got 30 minutes, so don't. <laughs> when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby did what? Leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Why? Because the baby in my womb, the gift of God, John himself, is filled already with the Holy Spirit. How else would a baby recognize he didn't know Mary's voice. Now I know, you know, ladies, you know, if you're going to have a baby, it's really good to sing to them and read stories to them and they come out already talking, right? <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. They, they already know you. I mean, there's, there is some, there's some recognition. Mom, they know you because they've been with you for those nine months. And if dad does some talking, they even recognize his voice, okay? But, but notice this. There's something special going on here. When this baby actually leaps for joy, Elizabeth recognizes it. The spirit Spirit reveals it to her because John, the gift of God, is anointed by the Spirit of God in the mother's womb. Oh, wow. Well, John, doesn't have, he's not just supposed to witness to that. And incidentally, John, the Gospel of John doesn't really talk about this moment, but it's an incredible moment when Jesus comes to get baptized. He joins with the other people who are, who, the people who have been repenting and, and and John 1 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. Notice, John the Baptist in the Gospel of John is not concerned with baptism and his privilege of baptizing the Messiah. His concern is with the Messiah. So instead of saying, oh yeah, I baptized the Messiah. Me here, John the Baptist. I had the privilege. Nobody else got to do that. I'm this great prophet. No, no, no. Look at what he focuses on. He says, look, and John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Matthew, Mark, Luke all record the dove ascending from heaven, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, landing on John verse John five thirty five, John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. This is Jesus talking. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. Folks, what's the difference? There's a difference between the word that's used here when it says John is a light that's different than when it says Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. That's like, the, the, it comes from the word, the word phosphorus comes from the word phos. What's phosphorus? Bright shining light. Think about the sun. That's kind of like the brightness of the light that Jesus is used to refer to as he is the light. But when it talks about John being a light, the, the word's actually John's a lamp. Lamps are turned on and off. Lamps have to be powered. Not phosphorus. It is powerful. Not Jesus the light. He is the light. But John is a lamp that's been turned on. A lamp that will shine for a particular period of time. A lamp that will point the way so that people will see Jesus. A lamp that will cause people by the light in the room to cause people to see their sin and come and want to repent. But that's not the only time John witnessed. He also witnessed hell as he's about to die. He sends his disciples, some of his followers, he sends them to go talk to Jesus. 
He remembers the day he was out there. He remembers the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus. He remembers and he's, he's been sure, but, but he's got this one thing that's going through his mind. What if Jesus is not the Messiah? What if he's prepared and pointed the way, but if, is there's that possibility that he's not? And so he sends his disciples, says, please, Jesus, tell me, are you the one? Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And then verse 9 says, Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So even as John's preparing to die, and Jesus does answer his question, by the way, and he answers it by saying, look, look what's happening to people's lives. They're being changed. This is evidence that the Messiah is here. Yes, I'm him, John. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, what are you going to do about the light? I asked earlier the question that Mary and Martha were both asked. On the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Not just do you come to church, not just do you sit in there. Word tells us, statistics tell us that 50% of the people that are in church on a Sunday in worship don't know Jesus Christ personally. May attend, may hear things, may say, oh yeah, I believe it. But don't know Jesus Christ personally. Do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? Do you have that faith relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you actually said, yes, Jesus, uh, humbly, I need you. I'm imperfect. You don't even have to read off the list because he knows the whole list. But here's my list, God. And I confess it to you. I admit it. I agree with you. I'm no longer going to hide it. No longer going to deny it. I'm an imperfect person and I need you. Please, Jesus. Help me to accept your forgiveness. Jesus, come into my life. Do you believe? And if so, and if so will you witness to the light? Because if you truly believe, you will talk about it. Notice, a witness doesn't just live it. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Shouldn't we live so that people can see Jesus in us? Of course we should. But that, friends, is not enough. I'm sorry, chill down. <laughs> Only one cup of coffee this morning, don't worry. <laughs> Will you be an outspoken witness to the light of Jesus Christ? Will you talk about Jesus? How many of you have talked about the events in San Bernardino? The rest of you haven't? How many have not talked about it? The kids haven't. <laughs> You've talked about it. If you can talk about a terrorist event which is evil and dark and mean-spirited and meant to cause fear and pain and sorrow and meant to tear apart a community, if you can talk about something that politics even will use for its glory instead of for Jesus Christ, can you talk about Jesus? Yes. 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 Will you witness to the light? Will you tell people? Will you tell people what Jesus has done for you? Will you invite people to believe in him? Because, folks, is the light making a difference in your life? If so, your sins won't stay hidden. Thank God. Because then they can get forgiven. If so... You're not going to hold on to sin like the woman caught in adultery. You're going to make the decision, I'm going to go back and change. And if so, you will want others to have abundant life. How did Jesus say it? The thief. We could put a lot of other words in there, couldn't we? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy 
And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. If we had an active shooter come in the door right now, what would we do? Somebody make a really loud noise. Not loud enough, even louder. More! Louder! More! More! Okay, if, if, you, if we had an active shooter coming in that door, what would you do right now? Well, let me give you some practical things that you should do that you might want to think of. First off, do you know where the exit is? If that's the door they're coming in, do you know that there's an exit over there? There's an exit down there. There's even an exit down the stairs. Do you know who's bigger than you that you could shove in front of you? Excuse me. <laughs> if an active shooter came in that door, what would you do? Dive to the floor? Run? Those would all be normal, natural, and appropriate responses. Would you be the one who ran towards them. But you're going to die. You're going to give up your life. You're not going to make it out. Not if you go that way. But would you be the one who goes to towards them? Would you be the one like Shannon who draped himself behind a chair behind his friend, his co-worker, and he said, I've got your back. <coughs> and at the hospital, she didn't know. She didn't know Shannon's condition. But she was still talking about Shannon, who had saved her life. Hence, the next day she found out that Shannon had died. <clears throat> Would you be that one? Because what Jesus is calling us to do is to witness to the light. <clears throat> to shield a world that's in darkness and to shine the light for them so they can see him. Why do we have communion? <coughs> to remember the light. To shine the light. Until Jesus comes again. To live for him. Regardless of what happens in the circumstances around us. For those who are going to serve communion.